a wonderful keynote speaker to kick this event off, and I will turn it over to Chief uh, U.S. District Court Judge, District of Minnesota, and one of our council members, John Jim. Thank you, Jim, and uh, my congratulations as well to our honorees today. Uh, we have a wonderful treat in store for all of us with our luncheon speaker today. We're going to hear about the moving story about the rule of law in the Jim Crow era of South Carolina. How the savage beating of a black serviceman by a sheriff led to an incredible awakening by both an American president and a South Dakota federal judge. I'm sorry, South Carolina federal <laughs> judge. And then that part of the country, South Carolina federal judge. Take a judge out of the Midwest. Yeah, the judge, the judge who, who was the son of a Confederate soldier. Courageous decisions that he made that led to, eventually, to Brown versus the Board of Education. This is a story that resonates today. We have federal district judge Richard Gurgle with us today. And he's written a fascinating book that all of you should read. And after the lunch is over, you can buy a copy and he'll sign it for you outside the room here. I encourage you to do so. It's a wonderful read. And we're going to hear about it this morning or this afternoon. Judge Gergel was appointed by President Obama nine years ago following a career in private practice. Uh, he sits in Charleston. And you may recall he was the presiding judge in the trial of the church shooter, Dylan Roof. He's a terrific judge, and he's an engaging speaker. Please welcome Judge Richard Gurdon. Well, it's great to be among my friends here in the ABA, and I have, uh, uh, you know, one of the unanticipated benefits of writing this book, you know, Writing a book is kind of like a very private experience. You're out there, you know, you're grinding away in libraries and in your office, and suddenly, you know, the world, you're, you're, you're able to talk to the world about what you've been doing. And the, among the groups I just love talking to as I've traveled the country um, uh, have been lawyers, uh, practitioners, and judges. I think as you will hear this story, definitely get this book. When I assumed the bench in Charleston in 2010, uh, I was aware that it had been a predecessor. Uh, United States District Judge Jay Waitis Waring, he had served um, our court from 1942 to 1952, um, and was the first of the really great Southern, courageous uh, civil rights judges. Um, he was a little different from um, some of the Eisenhower appointees in the uh, 1950s, Frank Johnson, Total Wisdom, uh, and Brown on the Fifth Circuit. He had come from a traditional Democratic Party background, Southern Democratic Party background, appointee of Roosevelt. And um, his evolution um, was, had been, long been a fascination of mine. Um, as I was awaiting confirmation, I began reading a good bit about Judge Waring. Uh, there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't a, I would say, a tremendous act about, amount, but there had been some um, historic treatment of him. And there was a great unanswered question, and that was, what changed him? How did he, um, how did he move from a traditional Southern Paul federal district judge appointee to this visionary civil rights um, judge? How, how did that happen? And um, I, wanted, I began asking myself that question in a very deliberate way. I began looking at his, uh, uh, at, at, uh, his personal papers, which were at Howard University, very interesting to do in 1951. Uh, he, uh, and, and, I, and he was extensively covered. I, I was able to chase down a great deal of uh, news articles on him of the era, and then a great deal of other independent sources. And that search eventually culminated in this book, An Example of Courage. As the clock struck 7 p.m. on August 14, 1945, President Harry S. Truman assembled the White House press corps in the Oval Office. 
The ebullient president was standing behind his desk informed the reporters that earlier that afternoon, the Japanese government had unconditionally surrendered, bringing an end at last to World War II. The reporters spontaneously burst into applause and then headed for the door to share this historic announcement with the rest of the nation. Thousands gathered in Lafayette Square across from the White House to celebrate, and soon there were calls, we want Truman, we want Truman. The president went onto the north portico of the White House to deliver a few remarks. This is a great day for free governments in the world, Truman announced. This is the day that fascism and police government ceases in the world. The great task ahead is to restore peace and bring free government to the world. But beneath the veneer of America's grand self-image is the bastion of freedom and liberty was a stark reality. African Americans residing in the old Confederacy lived in a twilight world between slavery and freedom. They no longer had masters, but they did not enjoy the rights of a free people. <coughs> Black Southerners were routinely denied the right to vote, segregated physically from the dominant white society as a matter of law, and relegated to the margins of American prosperity. Racial violence and lynchings festered just beneath the surface ready to explode at any moment. And this, um, this image is, uh, was known as the lynching flag. It flew outside the offices, national offices of the NAACP in New York every morning after a lynching in America. And in the first 50 years of, of the uh, uh, 20th century, um, that flag flew constantly. Black Americans living in other regions of the country had their own challenges. As the nearly 900,000 black veterans returned home after the end of World War II, they quickly realized that little had changed, and they began demanding their rightful place in America's free government. Seen from today's perspective, the American triumph over Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement might seem to have been inevitable. The collapse of morally indefensible practices wholly inconsistent with the United States Constitution. But in 1945, the black Southerners almost entirely disenfranchised. White dominated Southern state governments resolutely committed to the racial status quo. And the federal government largely a passive bystander. There was no obvious path to resolving this great American dilemma. Something had to be done, but what and by whom? My book, Unexampled Courage, details the long overlooked story of the beating and blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, a battlefield decorated African American soldier by the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina, on the day of his discharge from the military and while still in his dress uniform. And the transformative impact of this incident on President Harry S. Truman and United States District Judge J. Wade Waring of Charleston. Horrified and inspired by the injustice of this brutal event, President Truman would launch a civil rights program culminating in the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. And Judge Waring would issue landmark civil rights decisions, including his great 1951 dissent in Briggs v. Elliott that would become the model for Brown v. Board of Education three years later. Late in the afternoon of February 12, 1946, Isaac Woodard boarded a Greyhound bus in Augusta, Georgia, after discharging hours earlier from nearby Camp Thornton, and was traveling to Columbia, South Carolina, and then on to his hometown of Winsboro, where he was to rendezvous with his wife after several years of separation due to military service. During one of, the, his frequent, during one of the bus's frequent stops along the way, Woodard approached the white bus driver and asked if he could step off the bus to relieve himself. <coughs> At that time, interstate buses did not have restrooms, and Greyhound drivers were directed to accommodate such requests from the passengers. Instead, the bus driver cursed Woodard, telling him, I ain't got time to wait, and ordered him to return to his seat at the back of the bus. To his apparent astonishment, 
would have cursed the bus driver and told him, talk to me like I'm talking to you. I am a man just like you. The stunned bus driver told Woodard to go ahead, but at the next stop in Baysburg, South Carolina, the bus driver, now no longer concerned with staying on schedule, departed his bus in search of a police officer to have Woodard removed from the bus and arrested. Woodard soon found himself confronted by the police chief of Baysburg, Linwood Shaw, who responded to Woodard's effort to explain himself by striking him over the head with his blackjack and escorting Woodard off to the town jail. On the way, Woodard was repeatedly beaten with Shaw's blackjack, ultimately driving the end of the baton into both of Woodard's eyes. The sergeant was then thrown in a semi-conscious state into the jail, a jail cell for the night. When he awoke the next morning, he realized he could not see. Later that morning, Woodard was taken to the town court and convicted of drunk and disorderly conduct. Accounts of the Woodard beating and blinding were reported in the black press and received nationwide attention when Orson Welles focused on the incident in his weekly radio program on ABC Radio. Mass meetings were organized in black communities across the nation to protest Woodard's treatment. And a benefit concert in New York City um, to, to, to assist Sergeant Woodard, headed by Joe Lewis, featuring such luminaries as Count Basie, Cap Calloway, and Nat King Cole, played to a sold-out audience of 23,000. And this is one image of Joe Lewis, of course, is on the left, then the reigning heavyweight champion, Sergeant Woodard, uh, in the center. Meanwhile, other black veterans returning to their homes in the rural South confronted other incidents of racial violence, including several racially inspired murders. No state prosecuted those in any, in any way, from these racial incidents in any way. On September 10, 1946, a delegation of civil rights leaders met with President Truman in the White House, deeply distressed by this wave of racial violence. Prior to the meeting, Truman's staff advised him that despite his desire to respond to the concerns of the civil rights leaders, there was little he could do as president to address these incidents. Criminal prosecutions by the federal government for civil rights violations in the South were fraught with problems. Most notably, all white juries deeply unsympathetic to uh, civil rights claims. And of course, why were, the, uh, why were the juries all white? It was because voting rolls were the source of jury rolls and that African Americans were essentially disenfranchised. Further, Congress was under the control of powerful Southern committee chairs who were determined to block even the most modest civil rights legislation, including making lynching a federal crime. As the meeting opened, civil rights leaders urged Truman to call Congress back into special session to address the spreading violence against black veterans. The president expressed sympathy, but he lamented there was little he could do because there was little public support for new civil rights legislation. Leading the group of civil rights leaders was Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, and Truman's most loyal supporter in the civil rights community. And in this image, he would be to our right uh, uh, of the president. And, and I will say, Walter White is a long forgotten name today, but in the, in the 30s and the 40s and until his death in the mid 1950s, he was the most important civil rights leader in America. It was apparent to Mr. White that the president did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. White changed the discussion by sharing with Truman in detail the blinding of Isaac Woodard. As the tragic story unfolded, Truman sat riveted and became visibly agitated with the idea that a uniformed and decorated American soldier had been so cruelly treated. Abandoning the advice of his staff, Truman declared, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. We have got to do something. The following day, Truman wrote his attorney general, Tom Clark, and shared with him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard, noting that the police officer had deliberately put out Woodard's eyes. Truman made it clear that the time for federal action 
had now arrived. He further indicated that he intended to appoint the first presidential committee on civil rights to propose a new agenda to address what was obvious, obviously America's serious racial problem. Three business days after Truman's letter was delivered to the Attorney General, the Department of Justice announced the prosecution of Batesburg Police Chief Linwood Shaw in the Federal District Court in South Carolina for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. <coughs> Meanwhile, the Department of Justice prepared the necessary documents to organize the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights. Truman charged his committee in his, on his first meeting in January 15, 1947 to be bold and to attack the root causes of America's deep-seated racial problems. He held the Civil Rights Committee's first meeting in the Cabinet Room to emphasize the importance of its work. In less than a year, the Truman Civil Rights Committee issued a landmark report titled To Secure These Rights, which graphically detailed America's profound racial challenges and proposed groundbreaking policies and legislation, including the ending of segregation and the armed forces of the United States. In the middle of his re-election campaign, where this was widely unpopular, Harry Truman fully embraced the findings of the Civil Rights Committee. And on July 26, 1948, he issued Executive Order 9981, mandating the immediate integration of America's armed forces. One of the most fascinating uh, uh, pieces of uh, doc historic documents I, uh, was provided by the Truman Library regarding Truman's decision was a letter that a friend of his had written him around this time in which he said, uh, he was from Missouri, he had been in Truman's battery in, in World War II in France, and he writes, he says, Harry, you need to get off of this civil rights issue if you're going to lose the South. Um, let someone else deal with this, you need to back off. Truman wrote him back, a letter he later told his library not to release until after his death, he didn't seek any personal credit for this. And he told his friend the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And he said, and he mentioned several other incidents as well, and he said, if I lose the election over this issue, it will have been for a good cause. Can you imagine people today doing that? <laughs> the successful desegregation of the military marked the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America. And I, I, this, I, this, um, image comes from uh, an African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender. Uh, and I, my son, watching this, uh, watching this before, uh, my presentation one day, said, Dad, that's a very interesting headline, but look at the one to the lower right. Posse bent on lynching searches woods for prey. America in 1948. The Justice Department's efforts to prosecute Linwood Shaw in the Federal District Court in Columbia, South Carolina, produced in the short term a predictable result. An all-white jury acquitted the police chief after only 28 minutes of deliberations. The case was tried before United States District Judge J. Wade Square, a Charleston patrician whose father was a Confederate veteran. Think about it, his father fought in the Civil War. Uh, and multiple generations of ancestors were slaveholders. Prior to the trial, Judge Waring was skeptical about the federal government's prosecution of a local police officer. But his views changed when he heard the highly credible testimony of the blinded sergeant, who described his arrest and vicious beating at the hands of Chief Shaw. As Shaw's supporters cheered his acquittal, few noticed that Judge Waring's wife, Elizabeth, who had attended the trial, left the back of the courtroom in tears. Judge Waring joined his wife later that evening, and both were traumatized by the trial over which he had just presided. The Shaw trial forced the judge and his wife to stare directly into the southern racial abyss, a view which would forever transform both of them. Waring later described the Shaw trial as his personal baptism of fire and his Michigan-born wife's baptism in racial prejudice. The Warings returned home to Charleston after the Shaw trial, resolved to learn more about issues of race in 
injustice, which frankly they had never given much to. Therefore, the Wimmerys decided to undertake a private self-study. Each evening after dinner, Elizabeth would read to the judge a portion of a selected work to allow the judge to rest his eyes after a day of handling his judicial duties. The couple would then discuss what they had read, often while driving around Charleston in the evening, a favorite pastime. Many people have said, well, what, what did they read? Well, they read first W.J. Cash, Mind of the South, which was an important book in the, in, in the post-war era, written by a southerner, who described um, the South's history of slavery not as a benign institution, which was the popular war of the day, but as an extremely brutal institution that then made the understanding of the, of the advent of lynching so understandable. Um, um, the Cash book was, was a frank discussion about the real condition of race relations in the South. Judge Waring would later describe it as tough medicine, but he said it was good for him. He then, uh, he and his wife then encountered um, the book The American Dilemma by Gunnar Murdoch. The Carnegie Foundation at the end of World War II thought that America needed a comprehensive study about the conditions of race relations. About 40 scholars were, um, were solicited to participate in this study. But the head of it was to be Gunnar Murdoch, who was a Swedish economist and sociologist. And they thought perhaps not being an American, he might see America's uh, racial uh, problems and challenges in a far different way. The book is 1,400 pages long. It is a remarkable piece of work today. And the Warings read every page together. And when they finished, there was no turning back. As Judge Waring's new views on race and justice emerged, George Elmore, a black businessman, filed suit in the Federal District Court in Columbia, South Carolina, in 1947, challenging the South Carolina Democratic Party's all-white primary. Elmore was represented by Thurgood Marshall, the 39-year-old chief counsel of the NAACP, who was already developing a reputation of almost legendary proportions as a skilled litigator in legal strategies. South Carolina political leaders were united in their determination to preserve the white primary, notwithstanding clear United States Supreme Court precedent holding white primaries unconstitutional. As soon as the case was assigned to Judge Waring, he appreciated that this was going to be very different. He went home and he told his wife, you know, my prior decisions have uh, would basically under the separate and equal doctrine required equality, like in teacher pay. He said, there's no separate but equal doctrine for voting. You either vote or you don't vote. And he says, if I rule for the plaintiffs, our lives will never be the same. His wife, now a thorough convert, a convert to the cause, said, I'm with you from start to finish. Judge Waring would later recall that he had to make a choice to be entirely governed by the doctrine of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. On July 12, 1947, Judge Waring issued his decision in Elmore versus Rice, declaring South Carolina's white primary unconstitutional. Waring ended his order by stating, it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the Union and to adopt the American way of conducting elections. This was advice not well received in some quarters. <laughs> the groundbreaking nature of the Elmore decision was immediately appreciated by the leadership of the NAACP. In a private note to Thurgood Marshall, William Hastie, who would later be appointed the first black federal judge in American history, stated, I have read the South Carolina opinion three times, and Thurgood, I still don't believe it. In many respects, I think this is your greatest legal achievement. But the segregationists would not give up. Soon, a new party rule was adopted, allowing blacks to vote in the Democratic Party primary so long as they pledged support to racial segregation. <laughs> Surprise, a new lawsuit was filed. <laughs> and on July 16, 1948, Judge Waring summoned all 93 members 
of the Democratic Party's executive committee to his Charleston courtroom for an emergency hearing, where he denounced their efforts to defy his earlier ruling and explained that a federal judge faced with contempt could impose a fine or a jail sentence. He wanted those present to know that for further violations, there would be no fines. Think about that one. Okay? <laughs> the threat to jail white people for violating the civil rights of African Americans hit the white establishment like a thundercat. But it worked. Thereafter, African Americans by the thousands began to register to vote in South Carolina. And uh, to give an example, in the 1948 Democratic primary, 3,000 African Americans voted in the Mississippi primary, 35,000 in South Carolina. The response of South Carolina's white supremacists was thunderous. Death threats written and oral were constant. A cross was burned at the Waring's residence and bricks were thrown through their living room window. Time Magazine described Judge Waring as the man they loved to hate, but also noted he was proving to be a person of cool courage. If the purpose of the unprecedented vilification of Judge Waring was intended to cower him, it did not work. Instead, he continued his study and reflection on race and justice in America and became convinced that the foundation of Jim Crow segregation, the Supreme Court's 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, was legally, historically, and morally wrong. Wearing then approaching 70 years of age and likely retirement, resolved to play a role in overturning the separate but equal doctrine. Wearing developed a plan to place a school desegregation case onto the docket of the United States Supreme Court firmly convinced that a majority of the justices would overturn Plessy if they directly confronted the issue. He noted on his trial docket a case from Clarendon County, South Carolina, Briggs v. Elliott, which sought to equalize the facilities of the district's profoundly unequal black and white schools, a classic Plessy v. Ferguson claim. What had happened was the NAACP um, uh, was convinced that if the separate but equal doctrine was actually enforced, that is, that African Americans would receive equality in pay and in schools and everything else, the South couldn't afford it and would ultimately result in, um, in the end of segregation. Um, but every time that strategy was used, the Plessy Doctrine was being successfully invoked again and again as precedent. That Judge Waring disagreed with that strategy. When the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, appeared at the Charleston Courthouse on November 17, 1950, for a pretrial conference for his case, which was to begin the, ne the next Monday, this was a Friday, he was advised uh, by court security that the judge wanted to see him personally in his chambers. I am sure Mr. Marshall thought, what have I done? He is summoned into the, he's brought into the office. The secretary and his judicial assistant closed the door behind him. And it was only Waitis Waring and Thurgood Marshall. Judge Waring said to him, Thurgood, I don't want to try another separate but equal case. Bring me a frontal attack on segregation. Marshall responded, Judge, this is on our agenda. It's just not tonight. This is not the case. This is not the time. Waring was unpersuaded, telling Marshall, this is the case. This is the time. Marshall urged the judge to think practically, noting that any decision by him overturning Plessy would be reversed on appeal by the Fourth Circuit. <coughs> Waring explained that since the challenge to public school segregation contested the constitutionality of a state law, he would request the appointment of a three-judge three panel in which he would sit. Marshall responded, well, judge, we'll lose two to one. <laughs> Waring agreed, but noted that any appeal from the three-judge panel went directly to the United States Supreme Court bypassing the Court of Appeals, and he said, Thurgood, that's where you want to be. Waring's plan was bold, even brilliant, but
but conflicted with the highly successful litigation strategy of the NAACP. They carefully built one legal precedent on top of another, never trying to get ahead of the Supreme Court. A few minutes after this dramatic encounter, Waring convened the pretrial conference in Briggs and publicly pressed Marshall on whether he was prepared to challenge the constitutionality of public school segregation. Marshall stated that he was and agreed to dismiss his pending suit and refile Briggs v. Elliott as the first frontal attack on public school segregation in American history. And I will tell you, this account of this exchange, and people always ask me about the ex parte communication. It was an ex parte communication. <laughs> uh, um, there's, no, there's no ambiguity about that. Uh, uh, they asked, you know, it, it had been recounted by a friend of Marshall's who was at the courthouse with him, who, um, and he gave two oral histories late in his life, long after Justice Marshall had passed away. He described this story, and um, uh, it is, Undoubtedly true. You can hear he had the whole thing in, because Marshall came out and told him right then what had just what, what had just happened. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time this account has ever been published anywhere. And as I was preparing uh, the book, um, I was at a, a judicial meeting, and uh, Judge Nathaniel Jones, Nate Jones, a wonderful member of the Sixth Circuit, uh, legendary figure, Judge Donald knows him well, and. Um, uh, someone said, you ought to talk to Nate because he, though he's you know, not old enough, he's 90 something years old, but he's not old enough to actually been there, he might know something about some of your stories. <laughs> and um, so I, I grabbed him at a conference and, and I said, Judge, um, I really want to talk to you about this. And he said, well, don't worry, we'll get time to do it. And I sat down with him and I, I told him, I said, I'm working on this, um, on the, on this book. And, uh, on Judge Waring, related to Judge Waring, and I'm very interested uh, in, um, in whether you might know anything about an encounter between uh, Thurgood Marshall and, um, and Judge Waring. Now, Nate Jones had been the general counsel of the NAACP in the late 70s. That is the, you know, the legal defense fund in the NAACP separated in the, in the 1950s. So he was of the, of the main organization. But he had been involved at, from the time he was a young man in the NAACP uh, back in Ohio. So I, said, I told him what I found in this interview. And he says, oh, no, that happened. <laughs> and I said, how do you know? He says, Walter White told me the story. That's the NAACP executive secretary, Thurgood Marshall's boss. He said, Walter White told me the story. So I think he said, well, is your book just about Judge Waring? I said, no. It's about um, an African-American soldier by the name of Isaac Woodard. He said, Isaac Woodard? I said, yes, sir, Isaac Woodard. He said, I knew Isaac Woodard. I said, Judge, how did you know Isaac Woodard? He said, well, I came back from the war, and I had not yet gone to law school. I was working for a black newspaper called the Buckeye Review. And my boss, who was the president of the Ohio NAACP, sent me to hear his speech, which happened to be at my church. And I remember he starts describing to me in incredible detail what, what um, Woodard was wearing, his uniform, his sunglasses. And he remembered the whole talk. And I was going, he, I said, he said, so I, about 30 minutes before the um, program, I arrived and I interviewed him. And I, did a, I wrote a story, put the buck out with on it. And I just happened to remember it. It just so touched me, this African American soldier. He said, I can't believe you're writing a book about it. I said, yes, sir. And, when I would go to, um, to do research, many scholars would sit in libraries and meticulously take down handwritten notes or uh, type into a laptop. I didn't have time for that. So I just used my cell phone and took pictures, <laughs> thousands of them. And I would come home and print them and put them in notebooks. And he said something to me about that Buckeye Review. <clears throat> and I reached into my phone and I found the article he wrote in 1946. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And he said, by Nate, by Nate Jones. He could not believe it. We read the article together, and what he remembered two or three years ago was exactly what he wrote um, uh, all those years ago. Although Marshall agreed to dismiss his original complaint and filed a new suit challenging the lawfulness of public school segregation, 
He needed to obtain the consent of his client to change a change in legal strategy. Marshall had a real concern about the safety of his clients if they took such a bold step in their rural and impoverished community. And he sent his top assistant, Bob Carter, to Somerton to discuss this change in legal strategy. Carter told the large crowd assembled at St. Mark's Church in Somerton that those agreeing to join the new suit could expect to lose their jobs or suffer other forms of retaliation. Carter told them that there was no shame if any of the plaintiffs felt they could not participate. But Mr. Marshall and the NAACP felt that the time had come to confront segregation, root and branch. An elderly gentleman rose and stated, Mr. Carter, we were wondering how long it would take you lawyers to figure this out. <laughs> With only two exceptions, all the original plaintiffs who chose, uh, the Briggs plaintiffs chose to remain in the new suit. The newly filed Briggs suit was tried in the Charleston Federal Courthouse in May 1951 before a three-judge panel that included Judge Waring. In prior years, civil rights cases in the South were sparsely attended by members of the black community lest they be identified as members of the NAACP are, are challenges to the racial status quo. But on the morning of May 28, 1951, as the sun rose in Charleston, African Americans lined up on the federal courthouse and down Broad Street as far as the eye could see, hoping to observe what many thought might be the most important case in American history. Judge Waring observed the massive crowd from his office window later describing the scene as a breath of freedom. And my dear friend Jonathan Green has painted this wonderful image of the opening day of the trial of Briggs v. Elliott. Those in attendance at the courtroom were not disappointed by the performance of Thurgood Marshall and his trial team. The trial included the testimony of Dr. Kenneth Clark, a social psychologist who had done groundbreaking research on the effects of segregation on black children using black and white dolls. The crowd was also entertained by Marshall's devastating cross-examination of the state's key witness, whose last name was ironically Crow. <laughs> you can't make it up. Many <laughs> joked that Thurgood Marshall, quote, sure loves to eat Crow, and one observer, referencing the renowned state attorney Bob Figg, Mr. Figg got his law degree when he finished law school, but he just got his baccalaureate address from Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> As Waring predicted, the majority of the panel ruled that South Carolina's laws mandating segregated schools were lawful under Plessy. But Waring, fully aware he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant and brilliant attack on the foundations of segregation in America. He concluded by finding that segregation in education can never produce equality, and it is an evil that must be eradicated. Segregation in education adopted and practiced in the state of South Carolina must go and go now. Segregation is per se inequality, written in May 1951. Waring also praised the, the Briggs plaintiffs, who he was fully aware had suffered severe retaliation as a result of their decision to participate in the case. And he, he, he noted, they have shown unexampled courage in bringing and presenting this cause in the face of the long-established and age-old way of life which the state of South Carolina has adopted and practiced and lived in since and as a result of the institution of human slavery. Waring's dissent was the first challenge to public school segregation by a federal judge since Plessy 55 years earlier. Let me, I realize we may be tight on time, so let me just pick it up just a little bit here. In early 1952, some six months after his great descent, Waring announced his retirement as a federal judge and moved to New York City, exhausted with his ostracism in Charleston. Waring followed closely later school desegregation cases filed in Virginia, Delaware, and Kansas, all which were consolidated before the United States Supreme Court with Briggs under the name Brown versus Board of Education. In all the other school desegregation cases involving 14 different federal judges, only way to swear he concluded that public school segregation, even if the facilities were equal, violated the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down unanimously its landmark decision in Brown the court explicitly cast aside the separate but equal doctrine 
and adopted the per se rule that all government mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional. First, advanced by Waring in his Briggs dissent. Judge Waring had the opportunity to do something you really think is good. I think a great stroke of fortune came down my alley. The other penalties don't amount to anything. They're offset by what I think is a really important contribution to the history of our country. A little over a year ago, as I completed Unexampled Courage, I visited the town of Batesburg and retraced the faithful path of Isaac Woodard from the bus stop where he was removed from the Greyhound bus and arrested to the storefront around the corner where he was beaten and blinded and to the location of the street where the town jail and court once stood. Joining me on this solemn walk was the mayor of Batesburg and the town attorney, both of whom had only recently learned of the Woodard blinding from me. On June 1, 2018, the town of, uh, attorney filed a motion to reopen the case, the criminal conviction of Woodard for drunk and disorderly conduct, town of Batesburg versus Isaac Woodard and requested and got granted a motion to overturn the criminal conviction. And several months ago, the town dedicated an historic marker, candidly telling the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. Members of Sergeant Woodard's family traveled from New York for the ceremony, and the mayor publicly apologized on behalf of the town for the tragic events of that fateful evening, February 12, 1946. Unexampled courage is a story that deserves to be told with all of its pathos, its brutality, and its redemption of the American system of justice. Thank you.